Hi guys, um, thanks for coming out and seeing me at uh, half past nine-ish in the morning. So, I'm going to speak to you about DNS tunneling. This is just really a, a, a crash course. If you've done DNS tunneling before, you're not going to learn anything super new today, I have to be honest with you. But if you've just heard about it, never really played about with it, this is sort of like, a, like an introduction to it. Okay, so, as I say, DNS tunneling, it does sound a little bit more complicated than, uh, than, than it really is. Uh, I promise you that you do not need a hard hat or a shovel or a drill or anything like that, but what you do need is an internet-facing shell um, and control over port 53. However, it's very likely that if you're not doing it in a test environment that it's going to be illegal. Um, so, behave yourself. So, who am I? question I do ask myself quite regularly. My name is Aaron Finnan. Um, I'm currently a student at the University of Abertay Dundee. Not sure for how much longer. Uh, I've been a security consultant and independent researcher for a little while. And now I'm a media whore. I'm one of those podcaster types. Uh, I currently have a show called Face Tech Weekly. I've spoken on a few things over the years. If you want to get a hold of me, here's my contact details. Um, you can find me on Twitter at fw one NUX, find my podcast at phoenix.co.uk, so on and so forth. So, quick rough outline of what we're talking about today, uh, just some of the history involved, a little bit of a technical overview, a limited snapshot of some of the tools available, maybe we'll have time to have a quick chat about those. Some of those uh, sites that I've seen, that, uh, some of those portals and stuff like that I've seen that maybe are a little bit vulnerable. Other things that we can do for the NS tunneling countermeasures and a little bit of Q&A for time for me. So, without doubt, this is very illegal unless it was on the, the uh, on your own test network. Um, however, I really hate using Sanzu quotes in, in security talks. It seems to be a cliche, but I thought it was kind of very aptly covered it. And it's basically the art of war teaches us not to rely on the likelihood of an enemy not coming, but on our own readiness to receive them. Not the chances of his, his not attacking, but rather the fact that we had made that position unassailable. Uh, and so I'm sort of meaning not if a hacker comes, but when a hacker comes. And this is why I think this stuff is important to learn about. It's for you guys, uh, my intended audience today, uh, for hackers. And I don't mean this media, blah, 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 what a hacker is. What I mean is a, a playful advocate of technology. Uh, a very good friend of mine, Pete Wood, um, from First Base, when I interviewed him for Hacker Public Radio, we talked about getting into the industry. And he said to me, uh, he was, you know, a part and parcel of what you do is to take things apart. It's in our makeup, most hackers are that way. Um, and that uh, if you haven't been electrocuted by 10, this probably, probably isn't the right move for you. Um, I'm happy to say that I was electrocuted tampering around with things by 6, and I can imagine I'm not the only person in this room. Um, anyway, so, moving on, a small intro. So in September 2000, uh, an article came across the Slashdot website, uh, and basically it was a bunch of uh, German researchers had come up with a protocol called NSTX, um, Name Server Transfer <coughs> Protocol. Um, however, the concept kind of got um, a little bit more media coverage when that little-known researcher, Dan Kaminsky, started talking about it and he released a set of scripts in 2005, uh, written in Perl, that made DNS tunneling reasonably easy to, to establish. Um, I mean, the fact of it is, is that DNS tunneling enables you to do TCP IP traffic over UDP, uh, over a UDP protocol, so it has its own challenges. Although DNS tunneling can help you obtain free internet and stuff like that, and I would argue that it's not free if you go to jail for it, but it's also very effective at hiding things. It's a very good covert channel. Uh, it's good for stealing data. Um, if you've got FTP and so on and so forth taken away, uh, you can establish a, a, an SSH or a SCP connection with data, so on and so forth. It also can be used for uh, delivering shell codes, uh, reverse, reverse connecting back. It's very good at traversing NAFs. It's an interesting concept. And there is some tools knocking about, I believe in Metasploit for it, and there's a tool called DNS CAD as well that you can use to, to um, use for it. So, in 1987, the domain name protocol came into existence, replaced a few RFCs. So about 13 years later, these German hackers that I was talking about, 
we're able to use a DNS tunnel provided by Microsoft's um, PPP dial-up update server. And they were able to uh, obtain free internet, basically. And this is because Microsoft allowed DNS lookups. Ivan came into existence after this, um, and it's based on NSTX, but it has password authentication. However, I'm going to talk predominantly about um, Dan Kaminsky's Osman DNS setup, because it's incredibly easy to deploy. So if you're wanting to play around in a test environment and, and get this thing set up, I, I always think that it's nice to get your hands onto something and be able to, to get a working result quickly so that you can get a feel for what's going on. So that's where I'm going for Osman DNS. Uh, it does have its problems, but it, it, it's good. So, I'm sure most of you know how the domain name server systems and all of this works out, but basically we have root servers that handle the .coms, the .orgs, um, all of these sort of things. Uh, and then, uh, these are broken down uh, into other uh, domain name servers that handle maybe the subdomain. So, the root will find example.com, and a subdomain uh, inbound.example will be handled by a different DNS server. Uh, and they have a number of records in them, such as an A record and alias and all of these sort of stuff. And the host name can be 255 octets, or you know, 255 bytes. Um, in addition, we can send a, a DNS text file back that can also contain 255 bytes. And it's within this 255 bytes that we're able to encapsulate data and send it back and forth. Uh, so, theoretically, a fake main name server signal on the other end, which will receive encoded responses, decode them, and re encode a response back. Uh, and this will be delivered by TXT. It's a very plausible avenue when you look at it this way. Um, this is what you would probably see in one of the zone files if you were doing DNS tunneling. Um, so, what really happens, the trick really happens, is that comes into, uh, your request will come into a uh, domain name server and it will use a recursive lookup to another uh, domain name server. And it's the second domain name server that can do the decoding. You can use the DNS and point directly to it as well. Uh, there is other settings. I have lots and lots of tutorials. This is kind of like uh, a beginner's guide. So if you are wanting links and further reading, do give us a shout, drop us an email, grab us on Twitter. There's about three pages of links at the end. Um, however, when I set it up, what I tend to use is I tend to use uh, a DIN DNS account. However, they don't allow you to do um, recursive DNS look, uh, to delegate a domain name server uh, on a free account. You need a premium account for that. However, freedns.afraid.org does allow you to do it. Um, personally, I quite like using a DIN DNS account to point home and have the fake DNS server sitting at the DIN DNS because it up, it's got some very good update scripts. So it makes it very portable if you, know, you move your fake server somewhere else. You can run some like DD client or something like that without very, with, with very little change. Your, uh, your, your setup has been run. Now I have to admit I'm a Linux job, so pretty much everything that I'm talking about today is based on a, a Linux Ubuntu type system. There is guides for doing it on Windows. They are in my, uh, my further links. So if you are a, a Windows person, give us a shout. Um, in the test environment, you know, if you are running Windows, you could always use a virtual machine, it'd be good. But the tools that we have, there's a script in Rosalind DNS called nomd.pl, Perl file, as I said earlier on. Uh, and this sits on the server. And you have to have root permissions to run it, because as I said earlier on, port 53 is a privileged port. Um, in addition, as well, if you are actually running a DNS server on the, the, the shell account that you're wanting to be this fake domain name server for DNS tunneling, um, you're going to have to look at IP tables or something like that to, to handle the fact that you've got two services running on the same port just to get the right things dropped and set up. Uh, so as you can see in my example here, what happens is we load up the script, uh, point it to local, and this is the, uh, the inbound DNS that's coming through. Uh, and we set the system running and it takes off. Then what we do is on our client, we install some of these tools, uh, like SSH. There's a few packages I'll talk about in a second. Now, how the response comes back is by a straight STD out, uh, out, which is in itself not very helpful. But we can use the proxy command within SSH to run 
the client script of Duncan and Sleeze Ridge, which will receive all of the uh, encoded responses and re-encode them back. Um, the upstream data, so our client will be sending in base 32, uh, <coughs> and our server will respond back in base 64, which allows uh, uppercase and lowercase and ASCII characters and so on and so forth. So we're able to transfer, uh, it just helps transfer the data. So we can see like the response comes back, it's pretty much encoded. Um, you can see an inbound request or something similar to this. Um, so a quick recap of what we need to set up, a, a, like a little setup in your house. Um, need to install some packages, as I said, based on Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, install Screen, because I have to be honest with you, DNS tunneling can be flaky sometimes, and if you're doing something, you get cut off. It can be a real pain in the bottom. Um, a couple of extra Perl library files. I have a copy of the script. Um, I have a copy of the setup on my own website because it can be a little bit difficult to find. However, I did find a version um, from a gentleman, uh, Andreas Gore, who retook Dan Kaminsky's work maybe two or three years later and kind of cleaned the code up and made it a little bit more stable. So that's the version that I have available. And that's just a, on my site that was forward slash software, forward slash Osman DNS dash slip ring dash version top. Hmm. And if you want to go to the site where the guy's original work was, it's just there. On a client, we need to install a couple of these um, packages, as I say. Basically, some Perl libraries for handling DNS and some base 32 stuff. Uh, and then this would be the type of command that we would run on our client. This is just to set up an SSH connection. There's other things that you can do, the man paid the documentation is still a little bit sketchy, but you do find guides about it. But as a proof of concept, and being able to tunnel SSH is a handy thing to have as well, you be able to proxy and so on and so forth. Now what's the interesting thing here is when you're doing your connection um, through the proxy of our, your, kind of your remote client, you're actually SSHing locally because you're proxy and back. So like a standard normal mistake for new people trying this would be to put um, their, their remote address that they're wanting to connect to, but the software has already made the connection, so it's actually a tunnel to the local host. It's strange, but it does make sense in the end. So, recap of what I basically want. Basically, so when you run this command, what will happen is the SSH server. Uh, will receive connection by the proxy command stuff that we got through uh, DIN DNS. And then we do the standard handshake, that's to say which connection is established. Um, I do, as I said earlier on, the sort of speeds that you can expect from this when you do this connection isn't particularly fast because as you can imagine, if we can only send 255 bytes in any single request and only receive 255 bytes in any request, even with some Kung Fu encoding, we're limited to the speed that we can get. And sometimes you'll see the speed probably not being much more than 10, 11 kilobits a second, if that. Um, interestingly enough, though, there has been some research. I can't remember which university they're from, but they, um, they've they been able to get up to 110 kilobits a second with their setup. But apparently the noise on the wire from a DNS server is about two or 3,000 times average. So I think some anomaly detection might pick that up. Uh, so some of the other tools available, um, iodine, very established. It uh, can be a little bit fiddly to get set up and working, uh, but in the long term, I would probably look at, at running, if you wanted to use this sort of stuff regularly, I would probably look at running an iodine setup. And how that works is that works up by setting up virtual interfaces um, so that you can set up almost like a VPN connection. Um, so, as you can see, even straight away, we've got more power for authentication and so on and so forth, a little bit more stable. However, it requires stuff to be put into the kernel and so on and so forth. So, a little bit gone home, and it certainly wouldn't be where I started. Well, it was where I started, but it certainly wouldn't be my advice. Um, Netcross is a little Java sort of based program that might be useful in restricted environments. I think it's Windows based. Uh, and with a little bit of playing about, you can get these Java applets to speak to each other um, over DNS tunneling as well. And obviously, the DNS cat tool is an absolutely amazing tool. It's basically netcat for DNS. And we can use this to, like I say, to tunnel shell codes and lots of awesome stuff like that. 
So some of the sites that I've seen during, well, not that I've seen, that my friend Bob has seen during his time and we've discussed this, <laughs> is uh, by the spoon pubs. It amazes me that we've had this problem for years and years and years, and yet we still find Weatherspoons vulnerable, we still find BT open zones. We might even find the uh, University of North East Scotland vulnerable, uh, but I'm sure that will be fixed soon. Um, someone told me Eastern Trains was vulnerable as well. But probably the most scariest thing, and I've not had a chance to check this out yet, but I've heard down the grapevine that T-Mobile on their 3G network allow unfettered um, DNS requests. It scares me for two reasons. Firstly, that's a throwaway, um, completely throwaway device when you think about it. You don't have to top up, you just get a 3G SIM card, 3G dongle, and you are remote popping about using the 3G network tunneled through their DNS. Uh, you've got no bandwidth requirements. And also, probably quite hard to trace unless you did something particularly naughty. Um, and this, it does, I mean, this, that's, to me, worse than, you know, unsecured wireless networks. You know, you don't have to find something with this setup. You can just plug it into your computer and move to somewhere else and job done. And if you do do something naughty, you can pretty much throw the disk, uh, throw the SIM card away and start again. It's very, very easy to test if, uh, if you're, like, the environment that you're in is vulnerable. Um, dig NS look up. One of those two tools will do it for you. If you get a private IP address, you're goose. It's intercepted and it's dealing with an internal. Uh, so if you use like dig and you get a public IP address, you're in with a very good shout. I actually haven't tried ping, but I was thinking about this on the way down. Even if the ping doesn't go out, if it does resolve, I have a sneaky feeling that that probably is a key indicator as well. Um, so Things to remember, an easy test on an environment that you're on, like a captive portal that you might want to log on to. Uh, I know universities and that sort use these sort of things, and you know, McDonald's and this cloud network and all of these stuff. If you do a dig and you get a public IP address, you're laughing. Other potential users, um, apart from being uh, a, a great covert channel, I mean, how many people in here monitor DNS traffic? <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, and, then, and why would you, you know, who ever told you, who, you know, where's the vector become so, so important, and that's why I think it's, it's important to talk about. Data theft as well, you may restrict SSH, FTP, SFTP, you may restrict a whole host of protocols, but if I can tunnel over DNS, I can take stuff out of your network. Now, fair enough, it might be a little bit slow, but if I leave something running overnight, I could take that sensitive document. Uh, not that I would, because I'm a nice guy. Um, and as I say, the most scariest thing is the, the, the shellcode stuff. Um, I don't know how much you've had to drink or smoke or something like that to come up with an idea that what we should do is deliver shellcodes over DNS. Um, that sounds like two o'clock in the morning walking back from the pub sort of security to me, like, but it works and it's effective. Um, and it does it, not avoids no. uh, Some proof of concept stuff. Um, the links are in my notes. Uh, and Metasploit payloads as well, there is a couple knocking that. Not had to play around them too much, so I can't answer that many questions about them. But the most important thing is to talk about countermeasures, which is unusual because I've done a few talks and normally countermeasures are defense in depth and all of those great buzzwords we tend to use. Um, but it's really, I've got two or three slides on this, and the fact is that it is, there is some things that we can do. This is a very hard attack to, to deal with. We want to offer services to our user, but those very services that we give open us up to, to, to potential attacks. Uh, so doing some t statistical anomaly detection is a very good, sort of, uh, very good kind of key. I mean, a dead giveaway is, is if you have three or 4,000 times the increase in base 32 encoded domain names, uh, there's a good chance that someone's up to something. Because the whole point of the domain name system is it to be readable and rememberable, do you know what I mean? So we're starting to see very strange domain name requests worry. Um, also, monitor the amount of data that goes over 53. As simple as that. You really shouldn't be getting eight and a half gigs worth of data over that. The, one of the biggest problems I've seen with uh, IDS monitoring DNS is because you get so much stuff, we usually like, filter that out. Like, mm -hmm. you, you just can't monitor, you can't get reports on IDS on DNS because of the 
number of requests that you continuously got. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good point. I'm not saying that that's a, a big indicator, but, you know, when you say, like, uh, you take a university campus, how many Google lookups they get in a day, you can't just say, if a domain name gets X amount of requests, kill it. Yeah. You just, it may sound a good idea when text speak to text, but the reality of rolling that out is that you're going to have problems. Uh, but having a look and saying, wow, we've got 25 times the increase on what we'd normally see in 53, maybe someone should have a look at it. I don't think it's a big problem now. But you're right, it is injecting the potential for more false positives. But it's a way not, do you know what I mean? Flagging up a long subdomain, we'll point it out as well. Yeah. No one's going to have a subdomain of sort of 50 characters a day. Yeah, the, 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 there is, as I say, those sort of anomaly lookups is a, is a good start, but they're, they're, they're not a silk bullet. They're not going to, in a, any way, shape, or form, uh, they're just going to give you a ground to have a look and say, right, there is maybe something going on I need to investigate. And I suppose that's all we can ask for. I think that's, do you know what I mean? I can't really ask for much more than that. If you are running like a full free app at this point, consider having your DNS server and call it out. I know this sounds stupid, but we don't see it. Uh, we've not seen it very much. Many organizations do this HTTP request rewrite game, and that's how they do it, uh, and, but still allow the resolvement of uh, external DNS. Bingo, we've got you. Uh, so maybe you could use a server locally uh, to route everything to an internal IP address, and then, once someone pays, let them do external requests. Um, the other thing, a little bit crazy, um, maybe deny all TXTs. Um, coming in. Uh, it shouldn't massively impact the network hugely. Um, in general, it's really kind of only incoming mail servers that would massively need this. And in, in the environments that we see now, we normally see a separation between what's handling mail server lookups and, and so on and so forth. But that might not be the situation for you, I fully appreciate it. Um, but that, that's as far as it goes. You can't really kind of take any more uh, zone files away because it will have huge problems. So in conclusion, I haven't really scratched the surface, I just wanted to kind of give you a tester and, and kind of give you some ideas. Um, if you're not looking at DNS, I did ask how many people are monitoring DNS and you get one hand up. There's a great potential that maybe someone else is or will be one day. Um, the uses are limited. The 3G connection stuff is massive. Uh, I do think so. And as I said earlier on, don't get fooled with this 10, 11 kilobits a second. I do think we'll see some increases in it before DNS set probably writes this out. So as I say, here are some of the links. Do please feel free to drop me an email uh, and I will send them to you. Now I haven't got much time. Um, I started a little bit late, but I'm trying to keep it to half an hour. So if there is a couple of quick questions, I'd be more than welcome to answer them if I can't. Uh, if I can't, then I'll, I'll find the answer in email when you, you're back. Does DNS, how does DNS sex so the kind of engine it signs the certificate. I haven't had a huge chance to play with it, I have to be honest with you. I don't think it massively, if you have a legitimate domain name and you're doing this, then, you know, it's signed, you're not. Theoretically, the, 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 the level that you're doing it, you're not actually, it's an implementation vulnerability rather than anything else, it's how it works. So, it, there's certainly further research, I think it's still early days for, and I, I have to be honest, I haven't done a huge amount of research into DNS, so just, just trying to go up to speed quickly with that. But yeah, I think it will throw some hurdles, but I don't think it will kill. So if I don't find you set up server side, what stops me from using it? Uh, very good point, and this is, uh, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, you have to be careful that you don't share your fake domain name server about. You obviously need an account on the on the box. Um, yeah, that's you, exactly. yeah, but you yeah, exactly. But I mean, you still need the shell account, you need the username and the password. But if you know those things, yeah, I, you know, if you knew my, my setup and my password, there's nothing stopping you from. But the same would be for any shell account and the same you know, it, it doesn't remove itself. But the service there is no authentic there, there is no authentication of really apart from your SSH sort of stuff. So you would be able to do some stuff. It is a way into your network as well. How do you compare these techniques with the ICMP uh, tunneling, for instance? Uh, do you seem to pay ICMP payers to the current channel? To be honest with you, DNA, the, the reason, if I'm honest with you, that I looked at DNS tunneling was a friend and I talked about this two or three years ago. Um, and I went and did a little bit of research afterwards. And 
that's why I'm into the DNS stuff and I wasn't into the uh, uh, basically ping tunneling sort of stuff. There was, um, but they're in kind of like the same bar as far as I understand. You know, I haven't had massive experience with them, but from what I understand, it is a tough choice. It is a personal choice. I mean, a lot of people do. From my experience, ping gets blocked internally all the time. And, you know, do you know what I mean? I have to be honest with you. Everywhere I've been and played about in corporate network term wise ping's blocked. So I think that would probably be one of the big advantages. Because people seem to think that ping means that you're allowing an attack of your network rather than ping being used as a tool. So people do yet yeah, attempt to block it. So I would say that, if I'm honest with you, that maybe availability wise, people are not looking at it as much. Are some DNS providers such as OpenDNS uh, protecting it? No. It's not their job to protect it. As far as I know, uh, it's not their job. It, it, you know, your open DNS is, open DNS is almost a, a, is almost a position removed from this situation. Um, you're doing the lookups, your DNS server, your fake DNS server, and your box is doing the lookup. So as far as open DNS is concerned, well, open DNS is claiming to be malware protecting your network. So yeah, I mean, this is not a malware attack. I mean, it could be used to deliver. Exactly. It could be used to deliver. It could be used as a vector. But it's an implementation situation. Uh, I mean, they're not in the communication in the middle between um, client and, and target. They're not. No, well, they're, they're, they're not. They're after the server. No, they're, you, after the, they're after the server. It's the server that does the DNS. No, if you only allow communication to the server. Well, then you would. You, 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 oh, yeah, you would. You should potentially still get around. I mean, I can't see open DNS doing this. Just, Statistical anomalies on base 32 and base 64 encoded requests. Do you know what I mean? But it, it could be very possible, it's a good idea. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I would like to thank you very much for bearing with me, and, and, and I hope that it's been of interest. If you find me sleeping somewhere, that's because I've had two hours kicked. <laughs>